Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the institutional event on Toward Nature Positive in Asia and the Pacific. With no further ado, we'll start with a video to make you excited about this whole session. So video start, please. Great, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Yoko Watanabe. I'm the Director of Environment at ADB's Climate Change and Sustainable Development Department. I am also the moderator of today's session on Toward Nature Positive in Asia and the Pacific. Today's session, we will have a keynote speaker. We will have a panel. We'll also have a Q&A session with all of you here on the um, audience. And we'll have a lively discussion about what we're doing on nature positive investments in ADB. This year's themes of Bridge to the Future is very positive for our discussion at the 57th ADB annual meeting. And today we are really talking about toward nature positive in the Asia and the Pacific. So some of you may be thinking why nature positive investment is so important as ADB being a climate bank and why is not climate enough and not, you know, why nature? The answer is very simple. Nature plays a critical role in combating climate change. And also it is a critical resource for the sustainable development in the region. And healthy, resilient ecosystem, land-based and marine ecosystem play a key role to mitigate and adapt to climate change. It is known that the ecosystems absorb nearly 50% of the human-made carbon emissions. So without protecting and restoring these ecosystem, we have no chance to achieving the Paris goals of 1.5 degree. And healthy ecosystem and nature-based solutions, including conserving and restoring forests and wetlands, and also promoting regenerative agriculture, can provide an important role in mitigating global warming. And moreover, over half of the world GDP, over 44 trillion is dependent on natural resources. In Asia and Pacific itself, the global nature, natural biodiversity crisis, with 63% of the region's GDP is reliant on it. It's 19.5 trillion is at risk if we do not restore and conserve nature. So our economy is reliant and our society is reliant on nature and its services. So just to before giving to the keynote, I really wanted to share with you our directions and what we are doing right now at ADB in terms of nature positive investment. So the slide is here. So um, even though our fight against poverty for most vulnerable community and marginalized community have witnessed rapid significant economic gains and poverty reduction in the region have happened over the past decade, this success unfortunately came of a cost of environment as well. So air, land, and water pollution has risen, especially in and around our cities. Ecosystem degradation has led to diminished services due to overexploitation and unsustainable land and water use. 
and the most vulnerable communities are at greater risk from these adverse impacts of climate change and natural resource degradation. So at ADB, given this situation and responding to the triple planetary crisis, we have been working first at the first stage to do no harm to aggressively enhancing and apply environmental safeguards. And as we all know, we are updating the safeguards as well to make it also uh, nature positive. And also the second stage, which we are now, is ADB has taken actions and invested on many of the projects in operation to generate co-benefits and also consider environmental issues in the project and shift from a primary objective of the project having environmental improvements, not only mitigating the negative environmental impacts. So now we're entering into the third stage where we are looking into scaling the environmental sustainability and nature positive investments. And we'll be talking today with the panelists about how we make that shift to the scaling stage with all of you. Just to explain a little bit further on our approach at ADB, we clearly responding to the three uh, triple um, planetary crisis, we are forming ourselves into three sort of pillars, which is totally integrated and intertwined. So one of the pillars that we have is the biodiversity and ecosystem management pillar in the middle, the green one. And then the second pillar is the pollution control with air quality uh, and also circular economy investments. And the third part is the climate uh, sort of nature-based nature solution for climate which we are amplifying and scaling our nature-based solutions investment and also on the environment financing. So this is sort of a concerted efforts at every level from upstream, midstream to downstream, from policy to project level that we are engaging in right now. And just to give you a snapshot of where we are in terms of nature positive investment at ADB, we have about a total of 40 projects, which is investing around $7 billion right now. And we are taking a landscape approach to identify best viable solutions and cross-sectoral investment opportunities and working with all the sectors at ADB so that we can work on wetland restoration, uh, flood, restor flood mitigation, and all kind of uh, issues that we can use nature as a solution to sustainable development. And finally, I wanted to highlight that in COP28 last year, we have highlighted and established the new Nature Solutions Finance Hub to scale up these nature-based solutions with partners like uh, AFD and OPEC Fund and many other international NGOs and national NGOs to work on this initiative together and scale up and develop a pipeline of programs that we can work on with partners and de-risk those uh, investment and have a larger impact on the ground. So with that introduction, hope you got a little bit of gist of where we are um, aiming for. We are developing our ongoing approach and strategies moving forward on environment and nature investments. And today we will have a great discussion with distinguished speakers and panelists. So with no further ado, I really like to introduce the first keynote speaker. First, Ms. Leki Wangmo, the Secretary of the Ministry of Finance of the Kingdom of Bhutan, who has been spearheading on the work on carbon net positive as well as nature positive in the country. And we're really delighted to have the Secretary. So over to you here. Thank you. Esteemed colleagues, uh, partners, friends, uh, I'm extremely grateful and honored to be here today at the Asian Development Bank seminar to discuss the critical role of nature-based solution in securing a sustainable future for Asia and the Pacific. Bhutan's development philosophy of gross national happiness aligns perfectly with the events theme, nature positive development. We believe that sustainable development requires shifting from mitigating environmental damage to actively restoring and enhancing our natural capital. 
This necessitates a paradigm shift for all of us, moving beyond exploiting nature to a vision where economic activities and eco ecological health support each other. The countries of Asia and the Pacific face a complex challenge, uh, tackling climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution simultaneously. Nature-based solutions offer a cost-effective and sustainable approach to these interconnected issues. Multilateral development banks like the Asian Development Bank are crucial in supporting development member countries on this path towards a nature-positive future. Innovative financial mechanisms like green bonds and debt for nature swaps can help DMCs, particularly those prioritizing conservation like Bhutan, secure funding for nature-based solutions. However, such na nature-positive investment mechanism and tools need prioritization and fast-tracking. Expertise with MDBs and more specifically ADB can make nature-based projects more attractive to private capital by assessing and mitigating potential risks. We need to foster collaboration and cooperation that is efficient and effective. Successful implementation requires collaboration between the government, NGOs, the private sector, and local communities. ADB can facilitate this dialogue, ensuring projects are inclusive, culturally sensitive, respect, uh, respectful of indigenous knowledge. And as in any case, we need to showcase and upscale success. Institutions like ADB can help scale up local successful pilot projects at a larger regional and global stage for broader impact at a much larger scale. These areas that I spoke of are neither new nor unheard of. They have been in our vocabulary for a long time, but we, need now, but we now need to move expeditiously and fast track them to actions on the ground. Bhutan has long uh, recognized the link between environmental conservation and economic prosperity. GNH, as I mentioned earlier, is a guiding light in terms of our broader policy framework. Our constitution mandates that at least 60% of our land cover remains under protected, under permanent forest cover. Today, today our forest cover is over 70% and more than 50% of our land is under protected areas. These protected areas of national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, and nature reserves are connected through an integrated network of biological corridors. This not only protects our biodiversity, but also provides vital ecosystem services of clean air, renewable energy from hydropower, and a thriving uh, tourism industry. Tourism is one of the major economic sectors for us. However, we are conscious that we cannot have unlimited growth, and we recognize our limited carrying capacity to protect the sanctity of our ecological, cultural, and social landscape. Our tourism policy is guided by the policy of high-value, low-volume tourism. Tourists pay a sustainable development fee of USD 100 per day per person, which we use to invest in health, education, and infrastructure development and our conservation initiative. As far back as the 1990s, Bhutan established the first Environment Trust Fund, and in 2018, Bhutan for Life, the first project financing for permanence in Asia was established by Bhutan. All of this were to fund our investment in nature. However, we realized that this is not enough. Bhutan actively explore innovative financing mechanism like green bond and payment for ecosystem services to further support our national biodiversity and conservation in initiatives. We are also implementing nature-based solutions like community-managed forest and other community-based conservation programs, empowering our local communities and providing sustainable livelihood. We are happy to share our experience and collaborate with other developing member countries. The time for action is now. It is now or never. By working together with a shared vision and a commitment, we can build a future where a thriving economy and a healthy environment are not mutually exclusive of each other. A nature-positive uh, future for Asia and the Pacific is achievable. Through collaboration between the, uh, the MDBs, the DMCs, the private sector, civil society, we can create a region that is prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable for generations to come. 
especially the league, and thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Secretary Wang Mo. This has been an inspiring talk, and Bhutan actually has been spearheading on the nature-based solutions, I would say, tw two decades ago already, bringing in the renewable energy uh, solutions and also bringing in forests and ecotourism and others as a way for economic development and so social development. So thank you very much for that message. For now, the next speaker is Mini Degawan. She's an indigenous Kankaini uh, Igorot from the Cardilela of the Philippines. She's a good old friend from uh, working together on indigenous people's rights. And I'm really excited to have both government views and the indigenous people's view here talking about the nature-based solutions. So thank you so much, Mini. Thank you, Yoko. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for um, including the voices of indigenous peoples in these discussions. True enough, we cannot be talking about nature-based solutions without talking about indigenous peoples. I was asked to give my perspective as an indigenous person on what is meant by nature positive. Um, it took me some time to um, come up with something that my community would understand. And really, nature positive for us is really just scaling up how indigenous peoples view nature and how we interact with nature. Um, maybe you've heard this before, and I just wanted to stress again and again that for indigenous peoples, nature is not something separate. Nature is not an entity that can be sold, that can be put on loan, or that can be conquered. Nature and people are one and the same. We work together to nurture each other. And the health of a community is dependent on the health of nature. And so for me, nature positive is when the relationship between people and nature is intact. We cannot deny the fact that in the region and in the whole world, in fact, this relationship between nature and people has been severe. Um, we have overexploited our forests, our marine resources. We have forgotten that the earth is our mother. And so it is because of that relationship being severe that we now face the problem of climate change and biodiversity loss. This is very unfortunate because we come from Asia Pacific that has so much natural resources that if we only stewarded it, it would be more than enough to take care of the needs of the current and uh, future generations. And we are also being impacted very, very negatively by the problems brought about this severance of relations. We cannot deny that we are every year facing the problems of prolonged drought followed by prolonged rainy seasons. So it is a very vicious cycle that we need to come up with to solve it. And so for indigenous peoples, the solution is we need to recover and strengthen that relationship that we used to have with nature. And so for the ADB and others who are interested in coming up with solutions to these problems, I urge of all of you to work with indigenous peoples. I'm not saying this because I am an indigenous person and I claim or we claim to have the solutions. No, we indigenous peoples recognize that the problem is so huge. There is no one entity that can solve that problem. We have to work together. For many years, indigenous peoples have always been pushed at the margins. We were always looked at as beneficiaries, or worse, enemies of development. And so we have to be tamed. I think we need to move out of that paradigm and look at indigenous peoples as partners. We want to be partners with you. That partnership has to be equitable. And so ADB, I think I should also recognize that the ADB has moved towards the right direction. 
um, in, in the review of the social and environmental safeguards, there is recognition of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And this is a positive one for Indigenous peoples, especially for the region. But we have to move beyond rights recognition. Um, I often think that we are being killed with recognition. Every other document coming out of international conferences recognizes the rights of indigenous peoples, recognizes the contributions of indigenous peoples. We have to move beyond rights recognition. We have partnerships. And when I say partnerships, we have to work together. We have to recognize also that indigenous peoples, because of the generations of oppression, injustice being committed to them, that we need to make sure that there are enabling conditions so that we can work together. The very mere fact that you needed somebody like me to come and speak to you in English is already an indication that one of the enabling conditions we have to make sure is in place is that indigenous peoples are able to converse with potential partners in a language, in a manner that is understandable for them. We have to recognize the diversity that exists among indigenous peoples. We are not a homogenous body. There are as many ways for indigenous peoples to think and to discuss as there are indigenous communities. So what are the benefits of working with us? I would have thought that it is uh, something very evident, but one, we have to recognize that generations of interacting with the environment that was given to us, whether they are forests or marine resources, we were able whole body of knowledge on how to deal with the environment. So if you work with us, you can have the benefit of the generations of knowledge. If you work with us because we are local, there will be more efficient use of resources rather than hiring very expensive consultants from outside the region, you get the expertise of the locals. And more importantly, we secure the sustainability of each and in every intervention because indigenous peoples will own these interventions, so they are very important. So we really, really need to explore working with indigenous peoples. And another good thing that the ADB has embarked on is this working with different entities who have different expertise and experiences like the Nature Conservancy, a memorandum of agreement where the ADB will be working with the TNC because they have worked with indigenous peoples and they have knowledge about um, different me uh, financial mechanisms. I hope and pray that um, maybe in the next assembly of the ADB, that the ADB will be working directly with indigenous peoples and as well as financing indigenous peoples development plans. In closing, I would just like to urge all of us that we become good ancestors. The measure of the success of nature positive actions is not for us to say it was successful. It will be our children. And our children, when they will look back and say, our ancestors were good, they managed for us to inherit our livable world, then and only then can we say that we have achieved the goals of nature positive. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Minnie, and also, uh, again, Secretary Wang Mo for this great keynote speech. So we will now shift to the panel discussion. So I'll call for each of the speakers so that you can be on the stage. So again, uh, Secretary Wang Mo, um, the Finance Secretary from the Ministry of Finance from Kingdom of Bhutan. Please take a seat here. And then again, Ms. Mini Degawan from the Kankani Igorot Indigenous People, and she's also a global senior manager on social safeguards at the Nature Conservancy. And the third speaker as a panelist is Ms. Christine Engstrom, 
She's a senior director of the finance sector office of the Asian Development Bank, being a champion of moving forward with nature financing. So thank you very much, Chris. And then last but not least, Martin Lemon. He's a unit head of the agribusiness at the private sector operational development bringing in the important private sector shift and private sector angle to this discussion. Thank you very much, all the panelists. Okay, so the first uh, round of discussion during this panel, we wanted to talk about what kind of approaches and opportunities there are with development member countries in moving towards um, working on nature positive investment uh, in relation to climate change and biodiversity crisis, and what can we do more? So I'll start with Chris. Um, so Chris, can you tell us about ADB's approaches and how we can increase and encourage nature-related investment and what you're doing right now with many of the innovative work that you're doing. Over to you, Chris. Great, thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about this topic, which is of uh, increasing interest to us um, with its, its overall importance. So from ADB's perspective, we have a public sector that has now seven sectors within it and then a private sector that's represented by Martin today. So we're trying to mainstream nature through all of our operations. Um, so first what we do is we work with governments directly in terms of just having that initial dialogue. We've been having a lot of dialogue over the years on climate issues, but now we're shifting to also bring in nature-based dialogue. So really for them, how to understand what is you know, what is the, the, the wealth of the nature that they have there and how to protect it and how to assess the risk that they have. Secondly, then building capacity within those governments to incorporate nature considerations into their budget policies as well as planning investments. So for instance, in terms of maybe some of the policy work, really looking at supporting reforms that we can help them with, maybe even revamping tax subsidies so that we actually encourage nature-based solutions as well too. And then helping them invest in nature research and build data that they need themselves. Um, the second broad area is in terms of, again, mainstreaming nature into our programs and our pipelines and our projects throughout ADB and through our multiple different sectors, as well as through the private sector. So a few just different examples for you is, for instance, we have an urban group. And of course, in urban areas, we see a lot of, of environmental degradation. But for instance, some of the interesting things that are going on right now in terms of development, developments of cities are creating sponge cities. So taking care of um, you know, what happens when there's large deluges like we've seen in Dubai recently in many areas as well too, and creating different types of runoffs that can actually um, manage the water flow better and then in fact conserve it for when the city needs it later on as well too. Um, also in terms of agribusiness, and Martin will talk about this more on the private sector side, but really looking at where from the public sector side we can um, bring in different types of climate uh, smart solutions that help in terms of managing the amount of land that's used or help to reduce carbon emissions as well too. Um, I'm from the finance sector. So from the finance sector perspective, we look at a variety of different approaches. So number one, starting to talk to banks building their own capacity internally to look at projects that they have, help them maybe have more of a nature-based positive footprint, working on taxonomies. So taxonomies are very important in terms of capital markets, so helping the capital markets expand beyond green uh, but to blue solutions, also helping them maybe create nature-based bonds or biodiversity bonds as well too. And then lastly, bringing in innovative financial instruments. And I know that some of you have heard about these, for instance, debt for nature swaps, which are very active and have been used in, in uh, South America, Latin America, Latin America as well too, sustainability linked loans and different types of thematic bonds as well too. And then possibly um, biodiversity credits. I'll stop here, my time is up, I'm being flagged. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris, for introducing so comprehensively what we're doing. And we also want to highlight that um, working on nature positive investment at ADB, as you know, with the, uh, the new operational model, the environment team, the finance team, the agriculture and other sector teams, we are working all together as a team to work on this in more uh, efficient and effective way. So this is great and we are really nurture this partnership. So now we'll move to a private sector, Martin. 
So can you tell us about ADB's approach in contributing to both biodiversity and climate change and nature positive investment? And I know you're doing a lot of cool deals with private sector companies. So please give us some examples and let us know what we can do more. Thank you. Thank you, Yoko, and thank you for being part of this panel. It's, uh, it's a great honor. Um, so ADB's approach to, um, to this challenge is to look for business models that would address uh, climate action, biodiversity, and rural livelihood, and at the same time, uh, be profitable and bankable. So that's, that's the challenge for private sector. So how do we do that? And the way to do that is to look at, um, at starting from having a product to sell, uh, a valuable private good, such as food, uh, which makes the business model viable. And then work with the company on reinforcing the other dimensions of climate and nature, which are the public goods. So the idea is to make, mix a private good and a public good in the same project. So we have a few examples. For example, we gave a $15 million loan to a wood uh, panel maker in Indonesia. And this company sources uh, uh, wood from uh, small farmers in Java. Uh, they grow uh, those fast growing trees on, on, the, on very uh, slopy land. And so it's an additional income for them. And it's a great uh, example of agroforestry and intercropping for these farmers. So and to reinforce this, this, uh, this financing, which is a natural-based financing, we have a TA to train those farmers in uh, climate uh, resilient practices. Yeah. We have another example in Mongolia where we gave a 30 million loan to a Kashmir uh, <laughs> garment maker. And they source from 1,200 herders. And here the challenge is to help these herders uh, to better manage their pasture, the pasture land, because it can, it can fast degrade. So we have another technical assistance helping herders to manage their pasture land and restore pasture ecology, because we have seen a, a decrease in the number of species on the pasture land, and by uh, this technical assistance, the objective is to restore the ecology of those pasture land, which is really the, the capital that is necessary for the livelihood of, of these herders and actually for Mongolia as a whole in terms of also of ecotourism and other dimensions. We also work a lot with company on integrated pest management to ensure biodiversity of the insects, for example, and, and on regenerative agriculture to look at the, the, the health of the soil. And beyond uh, land biodiversity, we also have some uh, focus on oceans. So we have an investment into an, an ocean-based aquaculture company in Vietnam and, and this company, so it's ocean-based, so it's, it's more sustainable and more resilient than land-based aquaculture because it's out in the ocean. And at the same time, we are helping this company with a seaweed project. We gave them a three million grant to look at R&D on this seaweed uh, that can be fed to cows to reduce the methane emission of cows. So it's, it's another example, very interesting example of nature-based solution. Great, thank you so much, Martin. I think, uh, you know, as we are talking about climate shift and then now to private sector shift, we can really provide that sort of important examples where there is an increasing interest from private sector to invest on greener and bluer, you know, investment. And I really think that ADB can show that examples and scale up these initiatives moving forward. So thanks for sharing that great examples. Um, now I really want to go back again to Mini to talk about indigenous peoples and local communities involvement and I think your call for action and what you know indigenous peoples can provide as key sort of inputs as well as solution providers and a partner was very clear from your keynote. But can you also share what are the key approaches and initiatives that indigenous peoples are currently doing on nature positive and nature based solutions so that we can really see how we can further work together on these issues? Over to you. Thank you. Um, yes, um, as I said earlier, while we have struggled to continue practicing our traditional livelihood, it is also a fact that our communities are also challenged to meet the needs, the economic needs of the current generation. So more and more, our people are being pulled away from those traditional livelihoods. So, um, you know, as the older generation in our communities, we recognize that we need 
um, it's not just for non-indigenous peoples, but even for our indigenous youth, we need to educate them. We need to teach them the old values of living with nature. So it's a constant reiteration of those lessons, and I think it's very important that this um, also supported and ensure that our youth are able to carry on. And the second and very, very important thing that we continue to do is to defend our territories. Um, I think after the pandemic, the challenges have multiplied because there is really a push by governments to quote unquote, recover financially. So there is more extractive projects coming to our territories. And so that is where we put in most of our efforts is to defend, to keep, to hold the line in our territories so that the forests remain standing. So these are the approaches, continue to educate our children and we continue to defend our territories. And, and while I have the, the floor, um, I think ADB can play a major role in this to, pro, to to support the initiatives by indigenous peoples and to also facilitate dialogues. I think having dialogues, not just among indigenous peoples, but indigenous peoples and governments and private sector. We haven't had the opportunity to dialogue with the private sector. We have a common goal and maybe the ADB can facilitate those dialogues so that we can come up with more projects that get scaled up and not just at the community level. So thank you. Thank you, Mini. I think you raise a really important point and also with access and benefit sharing at uh, the Convention on Biodiversity Discussion and others, there's a key role that uh, indigenous people and local communities can play in relation to the private sector in utilizing and accessing these resources. And I think there could be much more opportunities to work on these issues. Okay, so with that, um, now going back to Secretary Lecky, um, it was so inspiring to hear from you the experience of Bhutan in trying to sort of being the net positive um, carbon as well as nature positive investment. And for the longest time, I think Bhutan has invested in these areas. What were the key sort of challenges um, you think in pursuing this? And what can we learn from your lessons to replicate in other countries? I think there is an ample sort of rich experiences that you can share and scale up these initiatives. So over to you, Secretary. Uh, th thank you, Yoko. Thank you very much for the question. So uh, Bhutan, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in terms of our policy, uh, uh, gross national happiness, uh, as it is uh, known all over the world, has al always been our guiding uh, framework in terms of our policy. So uh, gr what gross national happiness pro uh, proposes is that we have to follow a balanced development approach and in their environment conservation is one of the pillars on which uh, we our economic development has to be pursued. So based on the uh, overall guiding uh, uh, policy framework, uh, our, our regulatory framework are then designed so that we are able to action on the, on the philosophy uh, or the, our broad guiding uh, uh, vision. So our constitution of Bhutan uh, uh, entrust uh, environment conservation uh, in the hands of every Bhutanese. Uh, very specifically, it mentions that every Bhutanese is a trustee of our environment and they not only preserve, conserve it, but must also they also carry the responsibility of improving on it. Uh, uh, based on that one, then, uh, like I said, the constitution requires us to uh, conserve our, uh, uh, I mean, to maintain uh, land cover under forest uh, cover. 60% is a requirement, is the minimum requirement, and today our forest cover stands over 70%. And in, in most of the, uh, in all the international convention, climate convention, and specifically if you note the Paris uh, Agreement, uh, Bhutan has committed to remain carbon neutral for all times to come. Today we are carbon negative. So those are the overriding, uh, you know, uh, broad policy frameworks on which uh, environment, na nature positivity is perceived in a country. But equally, uh, uh, you know, uh, matching the uh, political commitment, I, I think we should not forget the commitment of the people at the grassroots level. Uh, uh, the people at the grassroots level have also been the main actors in our, uh, in our conservation uh, story, uh, you know, reinforced by our cultural and uh, belief systems uh, where uh, nature is always uh, placed uh, uh, 
uh, placed as a very important, uh, 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 you know, uh, component uh, of the life. So environment, in a way, becomes a way of living for the for the uh, uh, for the people. Uh, having said that, uh, we have a set of challenges. Uh, if you look, uh, because we follow a balanced approach to development, therefore our growth uh, is always moderated. So if you look at it from that point of view, then over the years, post-COVID, what we realize is that uh, the economic aspirations of our people remains unfulfilled. Uh, because of our success in our conservation success, our people living in the villages face uh, human wildlife uh, conflict. So people in the rural areas are then pushed uh, out of the village because uh, uh, the uh, human wildlife conflict become uh, unbearable to them. So we have a host of issues that uh, we face, which means that uh, we need to do much more again to keep the people back in the villages or, you know, to pursue economic development that is able to uh, fulfill the aspirations of the younger people. I think it's quite similar to what Mini was saying in terms of the indigenous people, uh, but again, uh, without, uh, you know, compromising the, uh, the, uh, the overall tenets of our uh, visions and our broad guiding philosophy. So... Yeah, thank you so much, Secretary Lecky. I think uh, you mentioned uh, last week at the sustainable financing for Tiger uh, landscape that uh, Bhutan has actually allocated over 5% of your natural budget to conservation and sustainable use of natural resources. And I think this has been obviously opportunity, but challenge, I understand. And I think we can learn a lot from your experience and see what we can do in other countries in Asia and Pacific and scale up these initiatives on the ground. Um, at this point, I was also wanted to um, introduce and also uh, welcome the European Commission, Mr. Frederick Conrad, who is here. And uh, unfortunately, the stage is so small that we couldn't have him. But from the floor, if you want to make some intervention on what European Commission is planning to do and what you're doing in terms of nature positive investment. Thank you so much, Yoko. Um, at the European Commission, where I work for the DG International Partnership, I'd like to say we're very nature positive about Asia and the Pacific. And I think I want to call on um, what Minnie said that really what's important now is scale so more and more countries can follow in the footsteps of pioneers like Bhutan. Um, I don't know if people know, but um, our 70 billion euro Ndiki Global Europe instrument, which is our external assistance instrument, it actually has, in addition to a 30% target of uh, spending on climate, for 2024, we have a target that 7.5% of all our assistance um, is on biodiversity, and the target is for that to increase to 10% by 2026. So very excited to learn more from Minnie and Lecky and, and Martin and Chris and everyone about uh, how, how partners are thinking about that. Um, what we're doing more and more through our European Fund, and Sustainable, uh, Fund for Sustainable Development is that we're also working with the private sector. So we introduced what we call an open architecture of guarantees where we use the European Commission's budget to guarantee private sector operations realized by a plethora of development banks, including European development banks like EIB, AFD, and KFW, but also uh, MDBs like AFDB, um, IFC, and so on. We've just launched a global green bond initiative where through the EIB and other banks, um, we want to be an anchor investor in, in green bonds worldwide, and that also has a sustainable finance advisory hub where, for example, ADB is uh, one of the partners. Um, and through our European banks, we're now trying to set up funds that invest in things like carbon sinks, um, in regenerative agriculture, um, in, in really many different solutions. I think this is a very new, new area. And as the European Commission, we're uh, very devoted to exploring the diversity of uh, private sector opportunities too that exist to, to also have economic growth from nature-based solutions. Thank you very much, Frederick. And uh, it's really exciting to learn the European Commission's initiative and how we can further partner in the future possibly. Thank you for th that, for intervention. Okay, so we're going with the next round of sort of um, discussion, talking about more the scale-up um, issue. So I'll start with Martin on the side. Uh, we all know that uh, in order to really make a dent and shift on nature-related uh, investment, we really need private sector to come in. The gap between the investment amount is uh, close to one trillion, I, I think you mentioned earlier. And so um, how can we really scale up with the private sector and what are we trying to do in ADB? 
Yes, uh, Yoko, thank you. The, the needs for nature positive investment have been estimated at up to one trillion a year. And today, uh, it's around 200 billion a year that is spent on, on, on this investment. So there is, a, there is a massive gap. But what is very interesting is that if you look at those needs, 80% of those needs relate to productive assets as opposed to conservation. So uh, agricultural land, uh, fisheries, uh, uh, commercial forestry. So 80% of the investment needs have to go to productive, uh, to, to people, I mean, to, to people interactive with nature. So that's, that's an interesting statistic. And so this productive land is mainly related to private, private sector. So this is where the need to scale up private sector, because today, the 200 billion today, 80% of it is government funding actually. So you almost have to revert this 80-20 to, to the other side. <laughs> Uh, you, you, would you would want to bring the 80% from the private sector out for the one trillion. So how to do that? Uh, I think one way would be for government to set the right priority. Uh, if you look at what is spent on, on agri and, and food and um, nature, it's very, it's very small. It's around 4% of climate finance that goes there. Maybe 2% of private equity in the private sector. So the 10% target of the European Commission is, is, is the kind of ambition that we would want to to hear from the countries uh, like Bhutan. So I think government ambition is, is very important. Two, regulation can help. So I want to mention the EUDR, which is the European Union regulation on no deforestation, uh, targeting seven value chains, seven commodities. So this is, this is a strong incentive because any company uh, will not be able to sell to the EU if they cannot prove that the product has not, has not come from an area that was deforested. So it's a good regulation, but it, it also means we have to help farmers uh, and, and countries to meet this requirement. Otherwise, they may be excluded from very lucrative value chains. So you don't, you don't want to abandon the farmers because of this regulation. So th that's something that we, as ADB and development partners, have to be very involved to help uh, farmers meet, meet these requirements. So uh, another way which is more technical on how to scale up private sector investment into nature-based solutions is blended finance. So uh, I'm not sure you're familiar with blended finance, but it can be a few things. It, it can, it, one, it can be impact investment, simply equity investors that are willing to compromise on their return for, for an impact. It can be mixing donor money with commercial money. Uh, we have a forestry fund where we did that. We mixed uh, a commercial investment with, with donor funds to, again, uh, support this kind of impact. Mm. It can be using uh, carbon credits and biodiversity credit. So we, have an in, we had an investment in Bhutan, actually, in, into a hazelnut company, uh, working with 4,000 farmers to plant uh, trees on their land, and they will raise carbon credit because of the benefit of those trees and uh, also the biochar that will be produced from pruning the trees. So very interesting model. And I think the last example of blended finance with government blending uh, government funds into private sector, or, or, like, like was, or like the EU is trying to do as well. And, and that, that will be the next frontier to scale up private sector investment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. That's a great examples of how we can really scale up the work with private sector. And I think uh, the Convention on Biodiversity and, uh, and also SDGs also recognize that mainstreaming biodiversity in nature and production sectors is really the key to ensure that our nature base and our sort of capital, nat natural capital is conserved and sustainably used. So thank you very much for that. Um, moving forward now to Chris, um, many of our MDBs have actually come to a joint statement to work on more nature positive investments and coming together as development partners to invest more on this. And um, from your perspective, where do you see the opportunity to encourage investment on nature to address climate change and biodiversity loss? And what are the kind of initiatives that ADB can further in terms of uh, nature positive and react, um, impact to climate change. Right, no, thanks so much. I, th I think in terms of the MDBs, we have a really strong role in, in having this dialogue with the government, um, as I had mentioned earlier, but also in disseminating knowledge and successful projects that have been done as well too, to show what can be done with nature-based solutions. But importantly, and especially at ADB, what we're trying to do is importantly bring that private sector dialogue in with the government as well too. 
so the government understands, you know, what does the private sector need to actually do in nature-based projects. So that's a really important role for all of us um, and something that we can all do um, across all the MDBs. Um, the second thing is in terms of disseminating knowledge and data, which is really important. So for instance, um, there's a lot of really um, great companies out there that are collecting data. We can take those companies and bring them together in a platform and then bring that type of knowledge and those services to a country or help them develop it themselves. And in fact, um, our Nature Solutions and Finance Hub is, is um, exactly the type of platform that, we're, that we've created that we, where we work with other donors um, in terms of disseminating knowledge um, bringing data, bringing dialogue, and then very importantly, creating bankable projects as well too, bringing some of these innovative solutions, so working together um, and really catalyzing the private sector as well too. So we're using this hub as a great platform to really drive and scale projects. Most of the nature-based projects out there are really small. I mean, as Martin was really alluding to, so really how do we create bigger footprints in nature-based programs? And that's really in terms of, you know, looking more holistically at aggregating projects, talking to the governments about some of the big projects that they're doing. How can we bring in nature-based solutions there as well, too? Because we really need to do that because we also need to bring in more of the private sector and the private sector impact investors and other different types of private sector as well, too. And they need to see a little bit more of a bigger volume as well. Um, and they need to have the projects be, as Martin was rightly saying, you know, commercially viable. And that's, again, where we bring in these innovative instruments. We also need to be you know, having this dialogue more around the risk of, of um, you know, biodiversity loss and a lot of the nature calamities there, and then bringing in you know, the insurance industry, for instance, right? Um, the insurance industry can have a big role in working to help mitigate some of the, the risk from some of these um, great uh, events that we're seeing right now, but also positively, how can they help in terms of taking some of that risk so we can make a transaction bankable? So for instance, it was interesting in India, um, I was there in, in February, and um, Swiss Re was doing really interesting work in terms of creating um, insurance solutions for SMEs and working through banks to take off some of the risk um, that would help in terms of overall kind of climate problems as well too. So we really need to be thinking about also bringing in a multitude of different types of solutions, and that's what we can do as MDBs and convene all these parties together, and that's what our Nature Solutions and Finance Hub is trying to do. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chris, for summarizing so well regarding the different sort of angle of work that we need to do from pipeline development to having a financial instrument to make it uh, workable and then scale that with partners. Um, with that, uh, I'll shift to, um, again, to Minnie. Um, you've already mentioned quite a bit about how ADB can support indigenous peoples and local communities to address nature and climate change challenge. But can you maybe summarize in a few points, what can we do more and um, how can we partner with you? Right. Um, one of the things, and this is very important, is to recognize, as I said earlier, the diversity that exists and also the, the capacity needs of indigenous peoples. Having said that, there are indigenous people's organizations at the regional, national, and local level. I think it would be very important for the ADB to work with these indigenous organizations. Um, top of my mind, for instance, is the ICCA network for Southeast Asia. Um, they do very, very important work that needs to be scaled up and that needs also be to be recognized. They, they, they have just finished mapping their indigenous territory in the Philippines. And maybe for some of you, what does mapping have to do with nature positive? This is very important because indigenous peoples need to assert their rights over these territories. And the ADB can help by making those maps useful, not just for indigenous peoples, but for governments as well. Um, there is a need to support policy dialogues and policy reform. I'm not by any means saying that ADB should exercise uh, hand, um, heavy handedness and ask governments to enact laws recognizing indigenous people's rights. No, I think it's more important that there's a positive dialogue where indigenous peoples can show the government that we working together with you, coming up with the correct policies will make it in fact, easier for governments to meet their international commitments. So um, 
perhaps the ADB can have those dialogues uh, in terms of policy, like an assessment of existing national laws. I was just in a dialogue earlier where Nepal was saying things about an ADB project that's violating the rights of indigenous peoples in Nepal. And Nepal has ratified ILO 107, and yet there are no enabling laws for the government to implement that. And I think that can be a technical assistance for the ADB. So that's one of the things that can be scaled up. Like I said earlier, um, we can only be nature positive if the enabling laws as well as enabling conditions are there so that every sector, every stakeholder can participate effectively. So. No, thank you so much, Minnie. I mean, I think you put a really important point. Um, ICCA is Indigenous Community Conserved Area, and actually recognize that IUCN as a fifth category of conserved area, b um, building on the Indigenous people's rights and territories that they have been conserved. And Philippines and Nepal and others have recognized this as part of the protected area system. And those are very important sort of entry point for working together. So that's great. Um, so last but not least, uh, um, Secretary Lecky, um, I, I guess Bhutan has basically shifted from not the business as usual and really embraced the um, gross national happiness and moving towards positive nature approaches. So um, how can ADB um, support not only Bhutan, but also maybe governments to shift this needed sort of nature shift I could call and uh, work on climate change sort of shift together. Uh, uh, thank you, Yoko. I would like to keep the, my points very focused on financing uh, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, for a small country like Bhutan, what we experience is uh, uh, when you're talking of nature positive investment uh, and uh, today because there are a lot of the things needs to be further enhanced uh, when we are trying to pursue investment and financing, uh, we still come back to the conventional norm. Uh, if you're trying, for example, Bhutan, we are trying to uh, tap into our hydropower potentials. Uh, but whenever we are seeking financing, uh, the question comes back to uh, uh, debt as a percentage of your GDP, and therefore your economy will not be able to sustain it. Therefore, in Bhutan, we're also looking at how we can champion and spearhead uh, nature cost accounting. Uh, to uh, develop a scientific and robust model that takes into account uh, all the conservation, all the environment, all the nature, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that is abundant. Uh, and based on that, how can we access uh, financing? We're also aware that there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, in terms of multilateralism and the development in the green financing. But for most countries like Bhutan, we find it uh, sometimes very difficult to access this fund. The, the transaction cost that it takes to access these funds, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, it makes us feel, uh, fe uh, uh, it leaves us with a feeling that perhaps we are collecting breadcrumbs and, uh, you know, and then the effort it takes uh, to access this financing is sometimes just not worth it. Mm -hmm. So therefore, from that point of view, for uh, countries and for agencies that are uh, pursuing uh, nature positive investments, uh, institution like ADB really needs to champion, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 financing mechanisms, innova innovations in the space of finance uh, uh, to really come to the help of these countries and uh, to make financing available. Otherwise, without the financing, then like I said, uh, uh, it takes a lot of investments to uh, uh, keep the uh, environment the way uh, it should be. No, very, very important point. Thank you. Um, we do have a closing remark from Warren Evans, but uh, if you can give us like two, two sentences, like 30 seconds sort of pitch from all of you. Like if you wanted to convince a decision maker on how we should invest more on nature positive, nature sort of investment, what would you underscore? And uh, I'll go with uh, Secretary Lecky. Like two sentences maybe. <laughs> Uh, I, I like to believe that uh, investment in nature uh, is a very enlightened way of ensuring that we as a humanity survives. Uh, otherwise, uh, the way we are doing, uh, going about with the development, uh, we are going to drive our own race to extinction, and that may be the ultimate price that we will pay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mini. Very short. Work with indigenous peoples. We are ready to work with you. Great.
Chris? Uh, nature is a long-term investment that returns. So look for opportunities, look for partnerships, and work with local communities. Martin. For me, I think really that the farmers and the rural communities are, are the central response to biodiversity challenge. Uh, but they are also very poor, so we need to help them. So I think government could, for example, repurpose a lot of their public subsidies towards uh, nature positive rewards, as opposed to subsidizing uh, dirty fuel or fertilizer. They, they could shift this 600 billion of subsidies into rewarding good practices and nature positive investments. Great. No, thank you so much. Hope uh, all of you got inspired with these messages and hope uh, our further discussion with the governors and the board members and others at ADB have, will factor in these messages as we move forward in our dialogue. But with this, I really want to invite Warren Evans, our champion in moving forward with both climate and nature, our climate envoy from the office of the president to make a closing remark. And really, thank you so much, Warren, for coming in your busy schedule. Thanks, Yoko. And that was a great panel, uh, great mix. And, and so I have, I mean, you all said it all, so I don't have much to say. Uh, so in, instead, I'm, gonna, I'm going to reflect a little bit, and uh, uh, and I, I, many, I'm going to I'm going to answer your first question. So if we take stock today, then we are not good ancestors. Uh, we're doing a lot of really, really important. We, the global community, uh, are doing a lot of important, highly successful, highly impactful investments in nature, but not at scale, and not innovating near enough in terms of, of financing. So if we continue what we're doing, we will continue to have beautiful little islands of success inside a world of failure. And that's what we're doing. We're failing right now. So this is all about how to go to scale and do it quickly. Um, and, I, and I, I've got a few years left, so I want to go as a good ancestor. Um, I think that the, that, the, that the key message here has been given, that, that it is about scale, it is about recognizing that nature is not an investment simply in having a beautiful green space, but the, the investments that we're talking about are good for building resilience to climate impacts, Many of them are excellent for sequestering carbon, so addressing the, the, the greenhouse gas emission challenge of, of climate change. Um, they do improve biodiversity dramatically, uh, and they generate, generally generate jobs and, and help locally the national economy and global economy. And some of the initiatives have global repercussions uh, in terms of, uh, in particular, in terms of biodiversity and, and carbon emissions. So the opportunity is now. It's only, it, it's very interesting. I, uh, I've been working on, I started my career 52 years ago working on environment. Uh, and it's gone up and down and up and down over, over those many years. Only three years ago did climate and nature come together in a meaningful way. And it's that point in time that I've seen this, this kind of stagnant movement on nature go on that kind of a curve. And that's what we need. So we've got to build on this opportunity. And to build on the opportunity, we've got to work on everything that, that you all were talking about. We need to learn from Bhutan. We need to learn from indigenous communities. We need to work with governments to get the right policy framework, the right regulatory frameworks, so that the private sector can come in. And in ADB, we need to think about that upstream and not downstream. We can't wait until we've got a great idea that we're implementing on the ground and say, oh, wow, we could do some nature-based solutions as part of this. Or we could attract private capital to invest in nature as a part of this project. Those days are over. We've got to move up into the that we're what we call upstream analytical work in ADB and say, what are the opportunities here and design the projects, sorry, programs. I hate the word projects. I don't know why I said that. Design the programs, the investment programs, so that we are actually investing at scale over a long-term period. The last point is we can't, none of us, and I think many of you made this point, none of us can do this alone. 
This requires partnerships, and we look forward to the EU investing a lot of money in our, the EC investing a lot of money in our nature base, our nature solutions finance hub. Thank you very much. Um, but we have to do this together. This is a partnership that requires financing institutions. It requires the, the technical expertise that, that many of the, the TNCs and others have uh, out there. It requires governments and it requires the private sector. And if all of, of those par parties are not at the table, then we're not going to succeed at scale and with an accelerated pace required. So. Thank you very much. That was really great, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to close this, and I'll let you actually close it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Warren. Round of applause. And thank you so much for all the uh, panelists and speakers. This was such a diverse and different views coming, but also, as Warren said, a partnership that can make a difference. So I really appreciate each and every uh, part, you know, speakers uh, for joining us here. We hope that we had a more time to with the audience, but uh, we are here still for a few more days. So please do grab us anywhere on the corridors or here, and we'll look forward to the further dialogue, and I really appreciate appreciate the full house here. And finally, I just want to thank you for the volunteer here for, you know, enabling us to be on time and also supporting all the mechanics and all the logistics here, the 1ADB team who's been here as well as Manila supporting this initiative. So thank you very much and we really look forward to furthering this partnership on nature positive investment. Thank you so much.